Hello, Bygone Geek Universe, and welcome to your weekly dose of nostalgia. Step away from the stress of today and join me back in 1993. It's your time traveler's guide to this very moment, just way back when. All right, folks, I have another flashback filled episode. So let's go ahead and get started with our very first category, like we do every week, of what you would have seen on your marquee at your movie theater at this very moment today in 1993. So let's see what we got. Coming soon to a theater near you. Today in 1993, five of your top movies at the theaters included Free Willy, Jurassic Park, Robin Hood Men in Tights, Hard Target, and Sleepless in Seattle. Again, such a wild range of movies that all came out at the exact same time. Uh, These will be really fun ones to break down. So the very first one I'm going to do, I feel like, is the most, one of the most, yeah, I'm going to say it, is the most iconic movie, I feel like, on this list. It's none other than Jurassic Park. An adventure 65 million years in the making. Jurassic Park. Anybody and everybody that grew up in the 90s saw Jurassic Park. Unless you actually lived on the remote island where Jurassic Park was filmed, you saw this movie. It was just earth shattering. The CGI was so mind blowing. I remember watching it and swearing that these had to be real dinosaurs. The combination of the CGI and then the animatronics, puppets and things like that that they used, the robots that they used, like the velociraptors were so terrifying in this movie. It was just like to an eight year old kid at the time, it was this whimsical, amazing, astonishing world of dinosaurs and what kid back then what kid even in present day doesn't have a phase where you just are obsessed with dinosaurs so 1993 at this moment to have jurassic park just like capture the whimsy of us 90s kids was the coolest thing ever so the very next movie is an insane pivot from the legendary scale of Jurassic Park, but it also holds quite a fun place in my nostalgic heart and I feel like in a lot of other people who grew up in the 90s. It is none other than Robin Hood, Men in Tights. We're men in tights. We run from the rich and give to the poor. That's right. So I'm going to officially declare this right now, but the Robin Hood of my childhood in the 90s was not the animated movie, was not Kevin Costner. It was Robin Hood Men in Tights. This movie made me laugh continuously from start to finish. Mel Brooks just, he could take anything. The fact that he could take Frankenstein, the fact that he could take Star Wars, and he could take Robin Hood. Like, it's insane to me that he was so capable of taking very serious franchises and very serious storylines, especially especially when you compare Robin Hood of Kevin Costner to Robin Hood Men in Tights. They're just wildly, insanely different movies. A true? Bless you! So just to throw another curveball into this lineup, we're going to talk about Jean-Claude Van Damme in the movie Hard Target. Jean-Claude Van Damme is the hard target. Jean-Claude Van Damme was a pinnacle part of my retro childhood. I watched every single one of his films from Bloodsport on. I did not miss any of them in the 80s and 90s. He was so cool to me. His jump spinning kick, his splits, he was shredded, he was jacked, he was just machismo through and through. And the French accent, it's just like, he was so cool and hard target you took that cool factor to 11 in 1993 by giving him a glorious glorious mullet (laughs) i love this movie it is so good i feel like it's at the upswing the peak of jean-claude van damme it's like time cop era universal soldier era you know so to have hard target in this whole wildly crazy premise of an action martial arts movie of wealthy businessmen who hunt 
you know, poor and homeless people and they only offer them $10,000. I know in 1993, it seemed like an insane prize to survive being hunted by billionaires, but $10,000, my goodness, <laughs> like that's not worth it. How's it feel to be hunted? You tell me. Hard target. And we're going to keep this back and forth going by now pivoting right into the next movie is none other than Sleepless in Seattle. We're talking to Sleepless in Seattle. You called a radio station? So I'll admit, Sleepless in Seattle holds a place in my retro heart because I remember watching these types of movies, these romantic comedies with my sister and my mom. As much as I love the shoot 'em up, blow 'em up action of, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and, uh, you know, martial arts action of like Jean Claude Van Damme and Chuck Norris. I still was captivated. There was part of me that enjoyed this sort of like romantic comedy and drama and love and sappiness and all that type of stuff. Like, I feel like I was just this like balanced little kid. <laughs> it's just like I needed to see explosions, but I also needed to see sappy love that was directed by Nora Ephron. <laughs> um, and they still to this day, if I want to feel good and I want to kind of transport myself back to this time in the 90s, in 1993, I watch Sleepless in Seattle, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan under the direction of Nora Ephron. It's perfect. It's a perfect storm. It's so lovely. <laughs> it's so nice. I mean, every part of it is just so wholesome, except for the poor people that always end up being cheated on. <laughs> I think we always forget about the fact that there's cheating that's going on. There's people being unfaithful, but they're being unfaithful to find their true love. <laughs> but Sleepless in Seattle really opened. It was like a gateway towards future films of like Kate and Leopold, like a lot of Meg Ryan stuff. And then also to see... Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan on the big screen again with You've Got Mail. I just adore all of these movies. For as long as we both shall live. And the final movie that would have been on your marquee at this very moment in 1993 is Free Willy. It just has heart. It has soul to it. And it has a purpose to it that as the years have gone on, the decades have gone on, it has created this lasting impact on our generation, on millennials. I really firmly believe that. A kid standing up to protect this creature that is loving, this creature that shouldn't be held in captivity. And they did it in such a wildly amazing way. A kid raising his fist in the air and turning and the water raining down on him. It is a vivid scene that I vividly remember, and I feel like it will. It will go on in cinema history as a pinnacle moment, and a pin pinnacle moment that told a story that needed to be told. It's so, it's so great. Come on, Willie, I know you can do it, boy. I know you can jump this wall. Come on, I believe in you, Willie. So did you know in 1993's Free Willie that Jack Nicholson turned down the role as the villain, the villain played by Michael Ironside. I know, I couldn't imagine the intensity that Jack Nicholson, that the Joker could have brought to Free Willy. It would have been so much more of an intense movie. There would have been a way darker vein throughout this. But yeah, apparently Jack Nicholson turned it down because they couldn't pay him when, you know, he was used to making $60 million for Batman, you know, years prior. So for him to come into this movie, they would have, the whole budget would have had to go on to Nicholson. There's part of me now that knowing that Nicholson was right there, he was close. If they could just pay him the money for it, I don't think Willie would have made it if Nicholson was the villain in this movie. <laughs> it would have been crazy. Wait till they get a load of me. So another interesting movie fact about Free Willy is that 23 orcas were actually auditioned for the role of Free Willy, and 21 of them were owned by SeaWorld at the time. But as they started going through the process, SeaWorld officials actually got a hold of the script, and they disagreed with how the script was written. And they actually demanded for the script to have a new ending, where the whale didn't get away. You've got to be kidding me, SeaWorld. Loathe entirely. All right, folks, so let's transition into the very next category, just like we do every week, is what would have been on the radio? What were the top songs at this very moment in 1993? Let's check it out. 
Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Casey's Top 40. One of the top songs that you would have been listening to at this very moment in 1993 was none other than Whoop, There It Is by Tag Team. Whoop, there it is, hit me. As much as I was a boring white bread hillbilly from Northeast Ohio, I loved in the early 90s and throughout the 90s the hip hop of that era. It was just so catchy and so iconic. And whoop, there it is, was one of them for sure. I think it's so impressive when a song can just pretty much repeat the same thing over and over again and hold your attention for two and a half, three minutes. I mean, it was just so good. And I feel like one of the first things that got my attention when it came to hip hop of that era was ninja rap from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 when Vanilla Ice is up there performing. It was just, I think that was my very first exposure to hip hop of that era. And whoop, there it is, was right in that same vein. Party over here, a party over there, wave your hands in the air, shake the dairy, yeah. Another song that you would have been listening to at this very moment in 1993 is none other than Runaway Train by Soul Asylum. Call you up in the middle of the night. So I had no idea until today the impact of the song Runaway Train by Soul Asylum. I remember it coming out in 1993, but I was eight, so it completely went over my head. But now, if you watch that music video, I found out that it actually shows 36 real life kids that were missing at the time that that music video came out. And one of the coolest facts that I found out about this song, and it shows the impact that the, it made, is that 21 of those 36 kids were found and returned home because of the impact of that music video. So amazing, so cool that a music artist was able to do something that brought 21 families back together. That is so cool. And now when I listen to that song, when I listen to Runaway Train, it's, I don't know, it gets me emotional now. Like, they went over my head for so many decades, for 30 years, and now it won't. It means something, and if you didn't know that, it means something to you now. 21 families were completed because, were made whole because of Runaway Train by Soul Asylum. So cool. Runaway train, never going back. All right, folks, so let's keep this train rolling with our very next category of what would have been on your television at this very moment in 1993. So let's check it out. Stay tuned for a whole new season of TGIF. So if you've seen this show before, normally I do primetime TV lineups at this very moment in history. I'm going to pivot this one a little bit. So if in 1993 you were homesick and you were watching daytime CBS programming, you could have watched back to back Family Feud, Price is Right, and then the classic sap, sappy lineup of The Young and the Restless, The Bold and the Beautiful, As the World Turns, and Guiding Light. So this TV lineup holds a place in my nostalgic heart because if I was sick in the early 90s, most of the time I would go to my grandma's and she would watch me for the day. And what she loved every single day, like clockwork, were her soaps, were her shows, were her programs. And on CBS, this is it. This is what she would watch. She'd do the young and the restless. She'd do the bold and the beautiful. And as the world turns and guiding light. And yeah, I just, I remember, of course, as a little kid, I loved Family Feud and The Price is Right that came before that. I have such vivid memories of being homesick. I think when now when I smell chicken noodle soup or the little oyster crackers or the saltine crackers, <laughs> it makes, I swear, I start hearing the games of Price is Right in my head. It's just cues that, oh, I'm sick. I must be watching Price is Right. I must be watching Family Feud. But it also cues in my head these sappy drama soap operas of that era because I was there with my grandma and those were her shows and that's what she watched. Um, I think a lot of people's grandparents at that time, soap operas were huge and somehow still today in 2023, they're still huge. But I think it's because of kids like us that grew up around our grandparents and we have a little bit of nostalgia that rings back about those soaps. Um, so yeah, it's the, the lineups on daytime programming on CBS. Yeah, holds a place in my nostalgic heart for sure.
So here's another flashback filled TV lineup that in 1993 on Sundays, if you tuned into Nickelodeon, you could watch back to back Family Double Dare, Guts, and Are You Afraid of the Dark? At this moment in 1993, I adored the kids game shows and the top pick for me was Guts. Guts was the coolest thing ever. It's like you took American Gladiators and just gave it over to kids and just made everything more wild and more crazy. The idea of like, do you have it? It's the action sports game that's going to make you sweat. Like it was so over the top. And Mike O'Malley back in the day with his luscious full head of hair. And now I can feel his pain at almost 40 years old. I look back at photos of me and that hairline was so nice. And it just keeps creeping and creeping and creeping. But yeah, Mike O'Malley and his announcing. And then you had the British referee, Mo, which I had a severe crush on back in the early 90s. And the aggro crag, that whole thing of climbing up that mountain and trying to hit the buzzer and beat the other two kids that are next to you. And then you get that giant trophy, a piece of the aggro crag. Oh my goodness. The show Guts was just so amazing. And when you go back and you rewatch episodes of this, it just, it comes flooding back. And I think they need to reboot this show in present day and get us near 40 year old millennials climbing up that aggro crag with double knee braces, (laughs) you know, you know, elbow braces, all this other type of stuff, because I would do it. I would put, I would put my body on the line to get that, get that piece of that aggro crag. And let's go ahead and transition into the final category is what would have been on your video store shelf at this very moment in 1993. So let's check it out. Come discover the blockbuster difference. So five of the top video rentals at this very moment in 1993 would have been Encino Man, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Home Alone 2, Groundhog Day, and Benny and June. But let's go ahead and go through all of them, and we'll start off with none other than Encino Man. Join Sean Astin, Brendan Fraser, and MTV's Totally Pauly, Pauly Shore. So I don't know about you guys, but Pauly Shore was another big component of my retro childhood. I loved him in Encino Man, in Son-in-Law, in the Army Now, Jury Duty. He just had hit after hit after hit. And when you take Polly Shore and you combine him with Sean Astin and you combine him with Brendan Fraser, oh my goodness. And this whole idea of high school kids finding a caveman frozen in their backyard, like Captain America style. And then turning him into the coolest high schooler, the coolest hair, the coolest outfit, just this awesome looking skater surfer dude. Encino Man is such a great comedy, a great buddy comedy, a great high school comedy. It stands the test of time. (laughs) Shush! Hush, please! And the next movie we're going to talk about is the final installment of the trilogy. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Help, I'm a turtle and I can't get up. So in hindsight, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 is definitely the worst of the trilogy. But I do remember in 1993 loving the movie. I thought it was so cool that they were going back in time to feudal Japan and fighting like samurais. And it was just, it was so fun. But it's just now, I don't think it quite ages as well as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 or the first one, the original movie. Those have stood the test of time, but I will give it credit where credit is due. Back in the day, this was a phenomenal installment of this movie of live action Turtles, and I love it for that reason. It still holds a piece of my nostalgic heart for that reason. I'm not, I don't want to speak ill of what Seth Rogen is doing to bring Turtles back to the younger generation, to present day kids. But I wish somebody would bring back the live action Turtles. I feel like present day kids would adore seeing a modern day version of the live action Turtles. I have always liked Kawabunga. Another great sequel that came out at this time on home video in 1993 is Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Get out of here, you nosy little pervert, or I'm going to slap you silly. Mm. 
So it's a little weird talking about Home Alone 2 not in the winter time, not at Christmas time, because this is a Christmas movie to me. But it's crazy to think in 1993, at this very moment, it was released on home video. It was released in the middle of summer, in the hottest month. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know why they were releasing it, like, in the summer. This seems like it should be at the earliest an october release or like a november release like it should be something that's linked to christmas but there's part of me that wonders when i was a kid i don't know if i saw it as a christmas movie i i, I don't know if it's my own nostalgia as i've aged for the past three decades like i don't know if it's just like i've now linked it to christmas and it means that to me now um but yeah it's weird to see in researching this episode that it was a summer a summer vhs release now why would anybody soak a rope in kerosene merry christmas so i know i've listed off so far some very iconic movies but this particular one that was released in 1993 on home video I feel like it's a little bit of a deep cut, and I would be curious for listeners and watchers if you also had this movie as part of your retro childhood. It was none other than Benny and June. Benny and June, a romance on the brink of reality. Benny and June is such a wholesome, sweet, and at times deep and dark movie, and I think a lot of people might have overseen this in the early 90s. I feel like Johnny Depp was doing so many other very big things. And Johnny Depp is like everybody knew in the 80s and he's on this upswing and continued that upswing through the 90s and the early 2000s. Like he was just, you put him in a movie, he was going to kill it. He was going to do a great job. And he did that, just that in Benny and June. I feel like he was so funny and very Charlie Chaplin-ish. Um, he showed his physical performances um, he showed dramatic performances, comedy performances, all in one movie. And the final video rental in this lineup at this very moment in 1993 was the legendary movie Groundhog Day. It's still just once a year, isn't it? I'm going to say it right now, but Groundhog Day is a groundbreaking film with a groundbreaking actor and a groundbreaking director, and I have watched it thousands of times throughout my childhood and my adulthood. It is so good in every way, shape, and form. It is just a beautiful film that covers so many bases. There is deep, dark, dramatic parts of this movie that really tackle mental health and depression and anxiety, but then also has this beautiful upswing that goes and just shows you what you're capable of being as a human if you just pay attention to the choices that you make every day. Groundhog Day is so deep and so many people overlook that and I don't know why. I don't know if it's because it's Bill Murray and people are just like, ah, it's Bill Murray, I don't want to pay attention to that. But this is an iconic film that has stood the test of time. And I feel like if for some reason you have bitterness towards this movie, you need to go rewatch it again and really pay attention to the story that it's telling. Groundhog Day is amazing, without a doubt. Freezing their butts off, waiting to worship a rat. So did you know that the movie Groundhog Day wasn't actually filmed in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania? The actual location where Groundhog Day is held every single year? Apparently, Harold Ramis, the director of the movie, didn't quite think that the city of Punxsutawney had the curb appeal that he wanted. So he scouted out all these different areas and they landed on Woodstock, Illinois. And what's so funny is I have a personal story about this is back in the early 2000s, I was actually driving with friends to see Dane Cook, the comedian at Madison Square Garden. And on the way back, we saw we could do this little jaunt to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And I'm like, I love Groundhog Day. Let's go check out Punxsutawney and all the filming locations. Little did we know, it was this rickety wooden stage in the middle of a field. So I was so wildly disappointed to show up in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania and not see that charming little gazebo and that little downtown and be able to step in the very pothole that Bill Murray stepped into. It's all lies. It's all smoke and mirrors. Hollywood is lies. Wow. So the big question about the movie Groundhog Day is how long was Phil Connors stuck in that time loop? So my personal fan theory is that Phil is not caught in a time loop. I think 
that Groundhog Day shows one singular day that if you wake up and you choose a certain path, compounded a million times, this is where your life can go. If you choose a negative path, compounded a million times, this is where your life can go. This movie, I think, is deeper than we've given it credit for for the past 30 years. It's just a singular day. That's why in this movie, there's no Zoltar machine. There's no like curse that's cast upon Phil. We never know what happens to him because nothing happens to him. It's just a depiction of one man's one day and the compounding infinite amount of options that you can have in a singular day. It's so cool when you think about it. From Punxsutawney, it's Phil Connors. So long. So thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in to another week of Bygone Geek. And until the next time you see us or hear us, be sure to live your life with just a little bit of whimsy. We'll see you guys next week.